This is the Landmark Chamber's possession proceedings, what to expect when the stay is lifted webinar. Uh, my name is Miriam Seatler. I am chairing this um, presentation and I am joined by Brooke Lyon and uh, Kimberly Zia. Um, this is a strange uh, webinar in that we didn't prepare, um, we didn't diligently prepare um, before the end of last week, but we are very glad of it because uh, as some of you will be aware, 4 p.m. on Friday afternoon, there was a big change, uh, a lot of disruption in this area of the law. Uh, announcement came out from, there was sort of a lot of tweeting before um, Thursday and Friday, and then a big announcement came out, which extended the stay, making this seminar not as timely as it was going to be, um, and also announcing future changes that might take place. We're going to be addressing all of that. Um, but firstly, we're going to start with a um, a brief history lesson uh, just to take us back to the beginning of lockdown, the end of March, um, and see sort of where we've come uh, from the beginning of this uh, stay and where we are now. Uh, yes. so Brooke, if you just want to kick us off um, where it all started on the 27th of March. Yeah, absolutely. So casting our minds back to a completely different time. Um, we'll all remember back at the end of March um, when everything was quite unclear that there was the stay introduced um, initially as a pilot under practice direction 51Z um, and at that point all proceedings brought under part 55 were brought to a, a very abrupt halt um, when the, with the introduction of the stay and that included um, enforcement proceedings whether by warrant or writ um, and the initial stay was for a period of 90 days so up until the 24th of June. Now those of you that act for tenants would have been hugely relieved um, that you know they weren't due to be evicted, if they were due to be evicted that wasn't going to happen or if they had impending hearings um, those would have been adjourned or vacated. Um, and those of us who attended those hearings um, and certainly I was throughout March going off to court and attending what were still quite busy possession lists up until quite shortly before the stay, um, it was a huge relief especially at that time when we were all Know, incredibly concerned about the public health concerns um, and whatever else. Um, the, the first thing to say is that stay was initially very, very wide um, and it seemed to encompass all um, kinds of possession proceedings, including against trespassers, um, and it also included all sorts of possession matters, including commercial matters. Um, and this is, at the time at least, it was way beyond what people expected. People expected there to be some kind of stay in respect of housing possession, and that's what had been announced and what had been talked about in advance. Um, but the stay that was actually introduced was much, much wider um, than that. You'll also see on the slides, of course, um, Schedule 29 of the Coronavirus Act came in, um, and there was the extension of notice periods. So um, basically both for Section 8 and for Section, 1, no, Section 21 notices, um, the notice period was extended to three months. So for Section 21, that's really only extension um, of a month, but obviously um, quite significant, um, a substantive change in the law, basically. Um, and going back to what we were just, what I was just saying about um, the extent of the stay and the scope of it, everyone was a bit concerned, or certainly a lot of landlord lawyers were quite concerned at the scope, and in particular about trespassers, because squatter claims and claims where there was a significant risk of harm um, to, to, to the building or to occupiers um, couldn't even be brought um, either. So in light of that, the Property Bar Association and a couple of other organisations wrote to the master of the roles and said, look, did you really intend for this practice direction to encompass um, commercial possession matters as well as um, your average proper trespasser claim where the person's entered as trespassers? Um, and in light of that, um, those rules were amended, well, the, the practice direction was slightly amended. Can I, Brooke, can I just add to that? Um, sure. It's funny to remember that at the time, the chair of the PBA actually was the master of the roles. Um, and in the course of this whole stay, uh, the chair of the PBA, uh, Terry Etherton, has had to resign as chair of the PBA because he ended up writing letters basically to himself and realised that he had a conflict of interest. Uh, so the master of the roles remains Sir Terence Etherton, um, and we found a new chair for the PBA. Um, and as you said, it, this was a, an effective letter because changes were made. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and those changes, I think it's on the next slide, um, were essentially to in, in introduce a number of exclusions. So um, 
the practice direction or the stay would no longer apply or did not apply to trespassers to which Rule 55.6 applies. That in itself was a bit odd um, because if you look at Rule 55.6, it's actually a procedural about how you serve persons unknown. Um, but the implication appeared to be claims against trespassers, trespassers as defined within the CPR, and persons unknown trespassers were excluded. Um, which is a bit of a strange one, I don't know about you guys, but why a trespasser who enters as a trespasser, whether you know their name or not, is relevant. I, I've got no idea, but that appears to be um, what the exclusion was. Um, and then the second exclusion, applications for interim possession orders, so that special process of applying for an IPO, and then applications for case management directions, which are agreed um, by all the parties. So some sensible exclusions, but crucially, one of the things that you know the, the, the letter by the PBA had asked about was commercial possession or um, non-residential possession matters. That has remained at all times within um, the scope of the stay. And that was obviously quite different to what had been announced than what continues to be referred to as an, an eviction ban or a ban on housing possession cases, which continues not to be an accurate description of, of what the stay is. Um, so, Kim, given that the scope of the stay was sort of surprising and also um, criticised, um, how has this gone down in the courts since March? Um, yeah, so uh, like you said, a stay of this extent, um, as you might envisage, uh, was subject to some significant challenges, um, four of them at least that were fast-tracked to the Court of Appeal. Um, and so just to go through those, the ones that are on the slide there relatively briefly, we started off with Arkin and Marshall, which was quite a detailed decision from the Court of Appeal, considering all sorts of challenges to the stay, including the viries of the stay under of the practice direction 51Z under CPR 51.2, was this really a pilot scheme as that provision envisages? Um, the court said that was fine. They also said there was no conflict with the provisions of the Coronavirus Act. Effectively, that this stay was lawful. Um, the court then considered the sort of extent of that stay and whether the court would have power to lift it in certain circumstances and what those circumstances might be. Um, and while the Court of Appeal did not go so far as to say the court did not have power to do so, they said that in theory there was power to lift the state under CPR 3.1, it would almost always be wrong to exercise that discretion. Um, and the court that had great difficulty in trying to envisage a suitable case for doing so and warned against people just making applications in any, any case that they had to lift that state on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, the Court of Appeal also um, clarified that you can continue to carry out agreed directions um, and you can apply to have agreed directions embodied in a court order but those would then be stayed um, however parties can continue to carry them out in terms of the directions that they've agreed um, for witness statements exchange and so on during the course of the stay um, however his honour judge Parfit the court of appeal held was wrong to revise directions by order during the court stay period so it just sort of shows the extent to which the stay applies even to case management decisions. Um, then we had a Hackney and a Coro, which was about what happens with appeals. Do appeals, um, surely appeals are brought under CPR Part 52, so they're not CPR 55 possession proceedings. Uh, the answer to that is no. The stay is very, was very, very wide and does encompass any proceedings that were initiated under CPR 55 um, and not caught by the exceptions that Brooke has just gone through. Um, however, apparently this doesn't didn't apply to an ongoing appeal to the UK Supreme Court, the Court of Appeal said. Um, I'd also note a couple of potential exceptions to that. Um, I was involved in a case called Jarvis, Jarvis and Evans back in June, which was heard in June 2020, we assumed would be stayed, but the court decided would go ahead on the basis that it would, dealt with significant, a specific point of general public importance. Um, and the court did hear and rule on that, to sit on that case during the stay period. Um, similar, so then after Accora, we had Cop Copeland and Bank of Stock Scotland, which might have been suggested to be a, an example of exceptional circumstances in which the state could be lifted. Um, however, it's since been criticised by the court in TFS stores, um, who disapproved that decision and said, actually, this is a stay is a stay um, and nothing can happen in court at all during the stay period, not even the handing down of judgment, which is what happened in Copeland. 
Um, and again, reiterated this point that there's great difficulty in envisaging any circumstances in which it would be appropriate to lift the automatic stay. So I think what those cases just showed was the courts were quite rigorous in enforcing the stay um, and weren't very open to general applications to try and have it lifted, um, apart with a couple of notable exceptions. Um, <laughs> Wait, They're just hypocritical for themselves, right? Exactly. If the court decided to lift it, it could lift it. If you applied to have it lifted, you didn't have much chance. <laughs> okay, so not only is with the stay extremely broad and covered uh, pretty much everything with very few um, exceptions, um, but it was also about to be extended. Um, one thing we've learned, I think, from this whole saga is that if you want to find any news about um, housing law, Twitter is the place to be. Um, all housing law uh, seems to be announced on Twitter before you see it anywhere else. Um, so this is what happened next. Um, on the 5th of June, um, the Secretary of State for Housing announced that there would be an extension. Um, and then a week later, uh, the, the stay was extended. Um, so this is, we're coming closer to what happened on Friday. The stay was to continue until the 23rd of August 2020. Um, so that was Sunday. Um, and then a, a little bit was added to 55.29, which just said the same um, as 51Z, really, um, that the stay was extended. Um, but then it gets interesting. And I think this is the bit that people are going to uh, be interested in, or at least they definitely were interested in this before Friday, um, because then we get a whole new practice direction. Um, and Kim's going to tell us a bit about that. This is what you're all asking questions about, reactivation notices um, and 55C. Yeah, exactly. So this is the new practice direction that came out on the 17th of July. Um, it was laid before Parliament on that day. Um, and it was it didn't actually seem to appear on the MOJ website for some time. So we did spend a bit of time not sure what exactly that said. But we've now seen the contents of the new PD 55C, uh, which came into force yesterday. So just after the stay was lifted um, or was going to be lifted on Sunday. <laughs> Um, and this provides for these uh, so-called reactivation notices, uh, which are detailed in paragraph two. Um, and effectively what the practice direction says is that no stayed claim is to be listed, relisted, heard or referred to a judge until one of the parties files and serves a written notice confirming that they wish the case to be listed, reheard, etc. Um, now, this doesn't apply to claims brought after the 3rd of August 2020. Um, or in which a final order of possession has been made, um, the reactivation notice must set out what knowledge um, the party filing the notice has about the effect of a pandemic on the defendant and their def dependents. Now, one might ask question how a claimant, for example, is supposed to know what exactly the effects are, but I, the hope, I think, is that there's been discussions and dialogue between the parties during the stay period and that they'll be able to update the court on what, on what those effects are. Um, whether those effects have any relevance if you had Section 8 level, uh, Ground 8 level arrears before the pandemic hit um, is another question. Um, what the court's going to do with that evidence um, if it's completely irrelevant to the grounds on which you're seeking possession? Um, again, no, no answer so far um, to those questions. Um, where the claim is based on arrears of rent, however, as the claimant, you have to provide an updated rent account for the previous two years. Another important thing to be to note from that part of the practice direction. Um, and then effectively, if these reactivation notices aren't served in a case by the 29th of January next year, then the claim will automatically be stayed. But we're told this is not a sanction, so you don't have to apply for relief from sanctions to have the stay lifted. Presumably just apply in the usual way to have the stay lifted. I'm not sure what, we're not sure what, exactly what the test that would apply to that uh, would be. Um, and then there doesn't seem to be any particular form for these reactivation notices apart from the fact they have to set out the information provided there in the practice direction. Um, so I think that's it in, in relation to reactivation notices. The other important thing to note from this practice direction is that the, is the removal of the eight week period for listing um, of a first hearing in a possession claim. So it's modifying Rule 55.5. So there's no longer that eight week time deadline for the court. How many courts adhered to that deadline previously is, is questionable and we'll all have different experiences of that. But there was at least previously a backstop that the court was supposed to be working to and some pressure in the form of a deadline, which has now been completely removed. So I think this is, um, well, I think we've all sort of, we all sort of agree that this is formal acknowledgement that there's no 
haste to process the, the backlog of possession hearings. They want to do so safely and they don't want to put time pressures on the courts to deal with them quickly. Okay, one big question uh, which I'm hearing everywhere is to what extent does the landlord have to make inquiries into the impact um, on the pandemic, so they, of the pandemic on the tenant? So they've got to serve the notice, the reactivation notice, but are they entitled to say, I'm a landlord, I actually, my, my agent has been dealing with this tenant, I've never met the tenant, I've never emailed the tenant, I don't know any detail, I don't even know what job my tenant does. Um, to what extent does the landlord have to make inquiries or take any active steps to look into this? Um, or can they just say, don't know, not applicable? Um, I mean, the practice direction states that they have to set out what knowledge they have. So I suppose an answer to that is that you have no knowledge. I mean, the, there has been encouragement that there should be dialogue where possible between the parties. So I, I would probably encourage landlords to try and find out what information they can. Um, the risk is the tenant then provides a load of information that you didn't, you didn't have um, at the hearing um, and that affects the courts the court's decision. Um, and if you were advising tenants, would you be saying, uh, start spamming your landlord information about the impact that the pandemic has had on you? Because once the landlord knows, then the landlord surely has to put it in his notice. Yes, I mean, if you have knowledge, you, then de you definitely have to be including that in your notice. So as a tenant, if, you, if you're advising tenants, then that's definitely, I would definitely agree with that advice. I mean, from my perspective, I think there's a, just a disparity between what the practice direction requires. So it doesn't say you have to make inquiries. No. But there is a reality of when you're in front of a deputy district judge who is going to say to you, well, what inquiries have you carried out? Um, so I think, you know, for my part, at least, I think most landlords, if you don't want that question to be awkward at a hearing, probably it's worth um, getting your agent to send a letter and say there is a hearing can you let us know what your situation is and give us any relevant information um, and the other question is that uh, obviously no barrister wants to be in an awkward as you say uh, in an awkward situation for a judge but legally or procedurally what is the actual impact of, of serving a sort of half-baked reactivation notice I mean what if you get to the hearing and the tenant says well, I told you ages ago that I lost my job or I'd been furloughed or mm. you know, my income stream had gone and the landlord um, is embarrassed and has to, um, the, the landlord has basically served an invalid reactivation notice, but it's already been relisted. You're already before the judge. Um, what's the impact? And in particular, if you're relying on ground eight or section 21, um, what discretion does the judge have to adjourn this at this stage? Well, none. Yeah. But, but <laughs> there is a big difference between what the judge will do and won't. And certainly my experience is the desire to adjourn tends to be quite a, a strong one. Um, and if you can try to avoid that by being as upfront as possible, I don't know. It depends on, it depends on yeah, it depends on the judge on the day. But I mean, my instinct is to get it dealt with in advance so that when you do eventually get your hearing, as much of it is sorted as, as possible. Yeah, I, I fully endorse that, I think. Uh, everyone wants to know about reactivation notices. Just a few, <laughs> just a few more points. Um, Kim, you mentioned there's no precedent or anything or prescribed form for the reactivation notice. So um, apart from the fact that you're obviously available to take instructions <laughs> to draft a reactivation notice, um, what do you have any tips? Have you seen any reactivation notices? Do you, have you heard of people already drafting them? Um, does anybody know what they might look like? Um, I personally haven't. I don't know if Brooke has. has. Okay, but maybe Brooke will be able to speak to that better than it's I just, will. Then. I've just done a letter that says yeah. at the top reactivation notice. Yeah. So no it. statement of truth or anything? No. Not on the one that I drafted. <laughs> I'm not saying, I'm not saying anything. <laughs> um, okay, so just a form of a, a, of a letter. Okay. Right, I think we'll move on from reactivation notices. We might return to it afterwards, but everybody's... Uh, Everybody's questions seem to be about that. Um, so that addresses the, um, the practice direction. And if you went to a webinar last week, uh, that would have been what you were told, that that's the position. You might have been drafting your reactivation notices like Brooke has been doing, um, but it all changed on Friday. Um, and 
Although the government had repeatedly said that the eviction ban, as it's called, would not be extended and uh, Sunday it was going to be, lift it was going to be lifted, um, people were preparing and lining themselves up for this. Um, and our webinar, if it had been written by that stage, would have been very different. But then, Brooke, if you could tell us what happened on Friday afternoon. Yeah, so um, interrupting my holiday, um, <laughs> I shouldn't have been looking on Twitter anyway yet. So U-turn, um, in a month of U-turns, the government changed its mind and decided actually we're going we're gonna to ask um, the master of the roles to, to extend the stay. So on the 20th of August, so last Thursday, the Lord Chancellor wrote to the master of the roles um, and said, oh, can you, can you extend the stay? He then... Um, sort of, Got the rules committee together who then had to discuss it and vote on it and they by a majority on the 21st of august um, approved that amendment extending the stay until the 20th of september so for another four weeks um, and essentially it was said that the justification for the extension was on the basis that the government intended to make substantive changes to the law and needed some extra time to do so um, so yeah everything changed on friday and for anyone that had actually had sort of you know, anything listed this week, which I haven't, I haven't actually heard from someone saying that they did have a hearing or an eviction mm. listed this week, but it was way too late to suddenly you know, um, change change the plan or alter what was supposed to be happening. So we have had a question actually from somebody. Uh, somebody wrote in a question by email that they had a, a, a possession hearing listed on I think on the twenty seventh, um, which has uh, gone away. So. Um, Obviously, quite really, they were, yeah. you've been advising your client that everything will be back. You've patiently waited um, and it was supposed to be back on this week. And obviously um, now it's not. Um, and so how did this go down? What was the reaction to this book? Um, well, so I think so we've got up on the slides the, the letter that was published by the, the master of the roles. And I think it's abundantly clear if you read it in full just how irritated he actually was. Um, it's it's thin, thinly veiled in his, in his letter. But um, yeah, it's clear that he didn't agree and didn't think it was appropriate for, for him to be part of this kind of political ping pong at the last minute. Um, and this is not really how judges do things all at the last minute, having to, to change the stay a few days before it's due to be listed. And especially on the worst, on, on the last working day um, before cases were due to be heard. And obviously, um, I think it's caused quite a lot of chaos internally because the courts were actually getting to a point, clearly some hearings were listed, were getting to the point where they were ready to go or, or very nearly ready to go. Um, so it's caused quite a lot of internal confusion. Also, of course, that for landlords and for agents um, and for mortgage companies, it's a huge blow because um, the stay is not dis doesn't discriminate between different categories of cases. It continues to apply on a blanket basis. Um, and four weeks for, for a landlord who's not perhaps had any rent paid for a year um, is obviously a, a significant concern. Obviously, there's these are always two-sided issues, but um, yeah, especially for those cases that pre, you know, predate COVID, um, there's a lot of a lot of frustration out there. I think for, for landlords. So, am I right that even though this letter refers to housing possession cases, again, the extension is just to all possession. So it's the same stay, the same broad stay, which applies to appeals. It applies to all commercial. Really, the only significant exception is um, pure sort of squatter hearings interim possession orders and injunctions which are not really possession claims um, but the same broad stay continues to apply commercial and residential yeah. and uh, Brooke did you mention the other big we're going to get to this in more detail because everybody's desperate to for clarity on this but the other big announcement that was made on Friday was um, well we haven't seen any law practice direction uh, regulations or anything but this six month notice period thing yeah so again these announcements um from the government at the last minute and sometimes via twitter but the announcement has been that essentially the government needs time to um implement a, a change that will mean that the the notice period um for possession will be six months um and it sounds like that will apply to section 21 and section 8 but we just simply don't have any detail yet on how that's going to work um how it would operate and whether or not you know is the intention for it to be retrospective because that that would be significant um probably unlikely um but yeah so talk of you know substantive changes but those substantive changes are you know not law as of yet um and would require um certainly for my part i think they would require primary legislation um and not enforce as of yet so 
Okay, we're going to get back to that, but just just so everyone's clear, those, those are the two things that happened on Friday. Stay extended, and then just this general rumour about six months' notice. Well, it's not a rumour, it's a statement of intent from the government. But there's nothing, there's no, don't waste your time looking for a practice direction which says that, or any piece of legislation. There is nothing yet, um, apart from on Twitter, which um, talks about this six-month um, notice period. Um, so what I want to know is, is sort of where are we now with this with the practice direction that we just went through in detail? What do I do now about my reactivation notice, etc? Yeah, and I mean I think that's that's difficult because um, sorry I'm I'm going ahead of myself, but I think um, the practice direction is in effect. Um, it applied from the 24th of August. Just the question is what you do about it, and I think Kim's going to tell us whether whether she thinks we should still serve reactivation notices or not. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing to stop you. As Brooke says, the practice direction is in force. And, you know, I can see an argument in favour of getting your reactivation notice in now in the hope and in indicating to the court that you want your your hearing or your case relisted as soon as possible once the stay, the extended stay is lifted in four weeks time. But, I, but the reality is you're sending a reactivation notice to a county court that's trying to deal with a backlog of cases and figure out a new priority listing system potentially and just it might just get lost, forgotten, or confuse a, a judge who's trying, or the, the listing office who's trying to deal with it. Um, so I think it's potentially, um, and it's potentially a waste of money if, but if we get a change to the practice direction, because we don't know if this practice direction is still going to apply when the extended stay is lifted in four weeks' time. So I think, I mean, if you've started drafting it, keep it. There's no harm in, in, in keeping the draft that you've got, but I don't think there's any point doing very much with it until the extended stay is lifted because the main thing is the dates just don't really make sense anymore yeah you won't, it, it, there's it, in pd 55c there's reference to the 3rd of august and there's a special period between 3rd of august and 23rd of august and that just doesn't really make sense anymore the most yeah. obvious amendment to the practice direction would be just to switch the dates around um and, and just do, do the equivalent um, but it does, I mean, you do get the impression that the government is maybe doing a more substantive review of what's going to happen, of what's going to happen going forward. So either there'll just be a, switch, a, a quick change of dates or you might see 55C uh, scrapped entirely, I suppose. Perhaps unlikely, given that they've obviously put the time into developing this scheme of reactivation. Mm. But we um, just don't know what the, re what the cause of this extension of the stay is. And it could be that they're worried that this just isn't going to work and they're thinking of a whole new approach. We just, we, there's more questions than answers, I think, in this webinar, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, so, I, so, the, so the practice direction stays as it is, um, but queries as to how one interacts with it, given the dates don't really work. Um, and then practically, um, what do we know about sort of on the inside uh, mm. rumours at the bar um, about how possession proceedings are actually going to work on a practical level? Are we going to be still on, are we going to be doing these by video? Uh, is it going to be back to those long um, block lists or are there changes that are going to be made? Mm. I think the, the reality is to stress that publicly nothing has been has been announced in relation to this um, there are obviously rumors and discussions about what might be happening um, which includes having a fixed day for a review ahead of the fixed day for a hearing and I think that review potentially to deal with the reactivation notice or other things that have happened during the course of the stay uh, the courts are going to try and deal with things remotely where they can um, is, is the, it seems to be the, the going view um, there's also been a general proposal or there's a rumour that they're going to be trying to deal with 10, around 10 possession hearings per day, which is obviously quite a significant decrease for a lot of courts. Um, so I think, I mean, the indication is, and I imagine this is the key question on a lot of people's minds, is that this is not going to be resolved quickly. They're not, they're not looking at a way to fast track through the, back, the backlog of cases that's built up and, and get things back on track. They really are just trying to deal with things safely and, and effectively and make sure that there's still fair access for those who need it, um, including, for example, suggestions that the du that duty advice might be provided online or by phone. Um, again, practical questions around how exactly does that work if someone doesn't even know that they're entitled to duty solicitor advice, the kind of person who's turning up at court and being informed of that isn't going to necessarily know 
but they can go to a website. So how do they, how, how do we ensure that people are getting effective access to those services? Um, and then we've, there's been some talk about which kinds of cases are going to be treated as priority in terms of, of dealing with the backlog. Um, obviously, everyone thinks that their case is a priority for various reasons. Um, it seems like the priority is going to be given to potentially cases with significant antisocial behaviour and significant rent arrears. But again, how does the court know about that? It depends how you've pleaded your case, um, whether that's the grounds on which possession was initially bought or brought or whether that's something that's happened that's sort of in the background to why possession is being sought. Um, so effectively, uh, those are, that's the sort of general gist of what, what, what the, the rumour mill is, is producing about what's going to be happening, but we've had no formal announcements from the courts as of yet. Thanks, that's great. Just a few questions on, um, on this extension of the stay. Um, where will I find the, this has been, there has been a rule change, so where will I find um, any evidence apart from Twitter that there has actually been a, an extension to the stay? Um, there is a civil procedure rule. Uh, you'll put me on the spot now. Man. No, I think, it's, <laughs> I think it's in the rules. It's just, um, it was 55.29 and it's just, yeah. been, then just, just a date change. It. Yeah. So it previously said August 23rd and now it says, um, now it says September. Um, yeah, there has been some criticism of me that I suggested that the six month notice period is just a sort of a rumour or a tweet. No, it has obviously been announced formally by the government and we will see it happen. Um, but I think what's clear is that there is no, it's not law at the moment. Um, to be clear, for all um, Section 21 notices and Section 8 notices to be served at the moment, the relevant notice period is three months. And that comes from Schedule 29 of the Coronavirus Act. You will just have to look out um, for when that changes to six months, which we expect is going to happen. OK, now let's get into a bit more into this, um, this six month point. But what's going to happen with this? Yeah, so again, like we said, it's going to be pretty sketchy and I've sort of outlined in a way um, what we think is going on. Um, so the Secretary of State says notice periods will be extended to six months. Um, that's going to require some primary legislation, not least because um, currently um, the, the shelf, you know, the sell by date essentially for a Section 21 notice is six months. So um, you can only rely on a Section 21 notice if it was served six months ago or less, um, or you can only issue on the basis of a Section 21 notice that was served within um, the last six months. So there's going to need to be some substantive amendment to the Deregulation Act in order to Short, uh, should make that time longer for Section 21 notices. Um, you're also probably talking about an amendment to the Housing Act 1988. So it's going to require some serious thought. Um, and if, you know, if the government is going to do that, and that's certainly what they say they've intended, um, they're going to need to get their skates on once Parliament is back in the sitting um, and give it some serious thought, because suddenly the 20th of September is not going to look that far away um, if they don't get their, get their skates on. Um, I said earlier, retrospective effects. I mean, at the moment, like Miriam said, a notice um, would need to give three months. I can't see, um, it's not the usual case that um, these things have retrospective effect, but if it doesn't have retrospective effect, then one wonders what the value of it actually would be, because it will only apply to notices served after the act or the changes come to force. Um, um, so, yeah. So, yeah. So would I be well advised to uh, quickly serve some three month notices now? Very possibly, very yeah. possibly, yeah. Because if I wait around, they might extend it to six. And, it, yeah. and some yeah. people are outraged by, by the six month um, proposal, particularly landlords, um, but it's not unprecedented. And Wales did this at the end of July. Um, I think that in Wales, they don't have, uh, section uh, 21 notices don't have that same shelf life. So it wasn't such a problem, um, but it's not unheard of. And if you look at um, Schedule 29 of the Coronavirus Act, it's just a little exception for Wales. So I, I don't think it's um, it's not unprecedented and it won't be that difficult. Um, but the key point is that it, it just hasn't happened yet. Yeah, and also yeah, perhaps and also a broader question about whether or not and how this ties into the government's proposal to abolish Section 21 completely. Mm. Um, it seems like an odd thing to do to extend the notice period to six months um, on a temporary basis if you intend to abolish Section 21 completely. But okay. 
And if you look at what the government's put out about this, because that's what the, the tenant lobby groups have repeatedly said, um, this is just firefighting, you're wasting time, you've already announced that you are abolishing Section 21, so why, why tweak it in the meantime? And the government have come back saying, no, these are two different projects. We are dealing with the pandemic and the housing issues surrounding that. And then we will deal with the wider issue of is Section 21 um, you know, appropriate in policy terms. And they're not, it seems at the moment, they're not willing to deal with those issues together. But the, the tenant groups are asking for, it's called the Renters Reform Bill. And they're asking for that to be progressed, uh, saying that this is the prime time to deal with it. Yeah. Okay, so um, moving on to um, enforcement. This is a, a sort of unknown spoiler um, this is a, a lesser known change uh, but a very significant one and this relates to um, enforcement so Kim can you just firstly tell us about the context um, and then explain what the change has been um, yeah so I think obviously at the moment as most of you will know there's very limited um, requirement for notice in terms of high court enforcement um, of a possession order um, so under CPR 83 13 Two, um, you have to, in order to obtain permission for a writ, um, all occupiers have to be given notice of proceedings that's sufficient to allow them to apply for any relief to which they might be entitled. Um, and that was emphasised in the two cases that you have on the slide. Um, but effectively, that you don't need to serve formal notice of an application um, or more than just an informal letter. Um, anything, anything sufficient as long as as, as you're given notice that this is that, that entitles you to apply that would enable you to know that you can apply for relief um i'm actually going to hand over to brooke on uh, what's what what the changes are um yeah so um that you know that old position was certainly from a tenant perspective perceived to be incredibly unfair that if you were enforcing in the county court you would get notice of a of your eviction but if you if the landlord decided to transfer off to the high high court um, the tenant or the occupier might not actually get notice of that um, because the notice requirements were quite waffly and there have been lots of cases about what sufficient notice actually meant. Um, but now there has been this change to um, the rules which basically harmonises um, what notice requirements there are. So it's CPR 83.8A2 um, which says that a notice of ev eviction must be delivered to the premises and addressed to all persons against whom the possession order was made and any other occupiers not less than 14 days before the writ or warrant is executed, um, which is pretty significant because 14 days notice of a high court um, enforcement of a writ is much more um, than, than you know tenants or occupiers are used to. Um, it's important to note this doesn't apply for trespassers or straight, what we would refer to as straight trespasser or squatter type hearings. Um, but it, you know, it's quite a significant change um, in cases where, you know, the landlord thinks they're being clever to, you know, to get a transfer up to the, to the high court, get enforcement done quickly. This is going to act as a, as a significant barrier to that. And those 14 days um, will give tenants sort of a crucial period within which to get themselves sorted and, and organised before um, an eviction takes place. Thanks. I didn't, I didn't see that um, rule change came in, so that was good to know. So to conclude on where we are um, with possession, um, I think it's fair to say it is a bit of a muddle um, in that there is more change coming. And so all we can really advise you is what the law is today. Um, it looks like there will be legislative change and that comes with, it looks like there's gonna be an extension to the notice period for section 21 and section eight. It looks like it's gonna be extended to six months, but um, we don't have any details on that. Um, and for the moment, safe to, to be serving three month notices. Uh, procedurally, I think there's also likely to be further change. You might see a further extension to the stay if the government can't sort out more permanent change before the end of September. Um, and in terms of practically, um, what will possession claims look like? I think our conclusion on this is that it's gonna be quite slow. Um, the court will be listing things quite slowly on a priority basis. Um, and uh, it will be moving through the courts quite slowly. The reason for that is that they just can't have 
all those people waiting in the court waiting rooms um, as they used to for public health reasons. Um, another point to flag is to look out for this possible pre-action protocol. I don't think we've mentioned this yet, but back in March, the government announced um, that there's obviously an existing social housing pre-action protocol, but there isn't one um, for private uh, rented housing. The government said that that would be produced and it looks like that might be coming and might pour, uh, form part of um, how to get these cases either settled or back on track. Um, so I think that's the um, conclusion. As I said, the webinar will be back on with different speakers on the 15th of September. The law might have changed radically by then. So either come for an update or um, tell your colleagues it was useful. Uh, we've got loads of questions. So firstly, um, more on reactivation notices. I'm just going to address those quickly, but please, um, in the chat function, please add more questions and I'll read them as quickly as I can. Okay, a few quick, quick fire round on reactivation notices. I think this is a good one. Is it worthwhile a landlord putting in the reactivation notice details of their own circumstances and how the pandemic has impacted their own circumstances? I yeah. think that's a great idea. I think that's a good idea. I don't see why not put in front of a court everything that you can that you can that's relevant to the hearing i mean put it in a smaller font than than what you put than the tenant circumstances because that's the purpose of the reactivation notice um but i think um from what i've seen from the working group um uh, this is real insider knowledge they are going to uh, the court is going to be quite fairly having regard to the impact on the landlord and the tenant so the landlord as well as the tenant um and so I think if you volunteer that information, uh, that can only help you as a landlord. So I, I, think that, I, I think that's a yes. I don't think it can do any harm. Yeah. Um, okay, second question on reactivation notices. Uh, do I need one for the court if I've got a, a, uh, an appeal pending in the court of appeal on possession? Do I need a reactivation notice? Well, it depends on whether there's already been a possession order, right? Mm. That's true. So I think I think it's right to say that you don't need a reactivation notice if there's already been a possession order or a final order. Surely not. But the second question comes from that is if you don't write to the court at all, will your case just sit there forever? Mm. Now I've got a scenario where not an appeal scenario, but I've got a scenario where um, a warrant was due to be executed and there's an outstanding application for the eviction to be stayed. Now, if no one does anything on that. Will the court ever decide to do anything about it? We don't need to serve a reactivation notice because there's already a possession order. But surely someone ought to write to the court if you ever want to get it on. So there's really two purposes to a reactivation notice. One is to inform the court about the tenant circumstances. But the other one is just to um, grab the attention of the court. Yeah, whatever attention there might be to grab. Okay, so because one of the other questions was... Um, if I already have a possession order and I just want to get the bailiffs onto the job, do I have to serve a reactivation notice? You're saying no to that? No, if you've got a possession order, you don't need to. But in reality, if you actually want to ever get your warrant, um, you know, a, a date for the eviction, I think you're going to have to write to the court in some way or another. OK, I think that's all on reactivation notices. Um, one other query, uh, lots of people are asking where the N5B form has gone to. Uh, have it's you been gone for a while. Yeah, it's, it's disappeared. No one knows. Should I, what if I want to fill it out? <laughs> Hope um, that there's an archive somewhere. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think oh, essentially, okay. yeah, phone a friend, um, try and find an old um, or a, as up-to-date version um, somewhere online, I guess. Because there were some issues with it, with, with the dates not adding up in it or something. And so I think maybe that's why think, they've, they've tried to... Yeah, I think it. there was something wrong with that. And there was also something wrong with the defence form. I think um, yeah. I saw a blog post about that. But yeah, it's disappeared. No one knows. Just hide the problem. <laughs> okay, there's one more question. This was somebody who helpfully emailed their question in beforehand. Um, we just discussed this before. Um, this person person has got a claim against, well, their client has a claim against three defendants, uh, three of them are known, the fourth defendant is persons unknown, so they don't know, they don't have any details, they don't even know their name, um, and the court, before the stay, um, before the changes on Friday, the court listed it for a hearing, and that was going to be a telephone hearing. Now, the person asking the question is in difficulties, because 
um, they don't have the phone numbers for any of these people, uh, most particularly persons unknown. So the question really is generally any tips, uh, but should they either tell the court this needs to be an in-person hearing because we don't have telephone numbers, or B, should they uh, just ask the defendants and persons unknown by writing to them, ask them um, what their telephone number is and then provide those details to the court. Any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, from my, my side, my instinct is to say in a case like that where there's multiple defendants, um, the court would be less inclined to list it for an in-person hearing. Um, I mean, if you're dealing with one claimant and one defendant, they're much more likely to list it for an in-person hearing. But when you're dealing with multiple defendants, I just can't see them doing it. Um, that's probably going to require a minimum of five or six people in, in the courtroom. Um, so in, on that basis, it's more likely to be done remotely. Um, and it seems to me if you want to get that sorted as soon as possible, I would just write a letter to, to the address um, to all of the occupiers saying, if you want to attend this hearing, you know, please write back to me as soon as possible with your telephone number and email address so that a remote hearing can be organised as soon as possible. We just had a suggestion in the in the chat, which is actually seems quite of setting up a special email address and posting that at the site and telling them to contact that email address with contact details. If you don't want to give your own email address, that seems like a sensible yeah. option. Yeah, that's a good idea. And Kim, you said that you, you actually have had a phone conversation with persons unknown. I have. It was quite a, um, the, the joys of telephone hearings. You don't have no idea who's attending for the other side and persons unknown did manage to um, get details. I mean, obviously we serve notice of the hearing um, as required at the address and that, that they must have contacted the court and found out and got joining instructions from, from directly from the court, but no one felt the need to inform us that that had happened. So um, that was a nice, a nice surprise. Someone's just asked a follow-on question. I'm going to bring this to an end soon, don't I? But somebody's asked, this was a question asked uh, quite at the beginning of the stay, but has continued to puzzle people. If you have a possession claim against a, a mixed crowd, mm -hmm. so named defendants, but also persons unknown, it, is it right that that would be covered by the stay or why does that not fall within the exception? I would argue it does. Mm -hmm. I would argue it does fall within the exception. If you've got any person who is a pure trespasser and is persons unknown, you can you're outside the scope of the stay i would argue that yeah um mm. it's not been it's not ended up on appeal so i don't think we know yeah okay good question okay fine well thank you so much for all the great um questions and um, thanks obviously to brooke and kim for their um for their presentations um if you've got any follow-up questions then please do email us um otherwise as i said the um webinar is on again and um Thank you all for joining us. Thank you.